and uh, we will come uh, to the language itself in a moment. Uh, just a quick introduction. Arvind uh, already gave a gave a background, but basically I'm in a system and software architect. I'm an embedded developer and an electronics engineer. Uh, I've been working on Rust for about two, three years, and I've developed the Rust binding for the Cyclone DDS. That's the uh, a DDS implementation of uh, 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 open source Im DDS implementation, and I wrote the Rust binding for that. And I'm also building a Rust-based platform for auto and embedded systems. That's uh, you know something going on in the background. That's a pet project for me. And in my free time, I enjoy sailing and uh, ham radio. So you can uh, find me on LinkedIn as well as on Twitter, where I, you know, post occasionally. So this is not a language tutorial. Uh, the the language is, is is a big language as any language is, and uh, you cannot cover nitty gritties of the language in you know a short time. But my intent is to give you an idea of the, what is Rust all about. Why is it important? Why is it why is it a good language to learn? But before getting into the language, I will take a slight detour. Uh, so, Arvind, is there chat available on the um, uh, on the meeting? Or chat is available, but they can uh, you can give a pause. They can ask questions through their microphone. Okay, so yeah, uh, I will just switch to maybe electrical engineering for a while, and I have a question: What is more dangerous? Is a short circuit more dangerous, or is a loose connection more dangerous? So, well, in my opinion, short circuit is dangerous. Loose connection is painful. Okay, thank you, Vineet. Anybody else thinks the same? It depends on the scenario, Sajan. Ramya here. It depends on the scenario. I mean, short circuit depends on what is where the short circuit happened, what kind of a device. Similar for a loose connection also. So where it, it depends on wh where it is used, what kind of a device. So we can't say which one is uh, or the other without knowing the context or the device. So it depends on. Yeah, for me, loose um, connection. Loose uh, connection is dangerous. Hi. I think it's because of the loose connection, short circuit happens. So uh, both are uh, almost dangerous. Okay, loose thank connection. you, thank you. All right, so I'm seeing I'm seeing a mix of uh, opinions here: a short circuit and loose connections. And you're right, Ramya. I mean, it depends on the situation. Uh, but let's let's dive in and and thank you for the interaction. I think you know it shows that uh, we're all you know it's it's good to have this two way communication. So please feel free to interrupt with questions at any point in time. Uh, and uh, if you think what I'm saying you don't agree with something, please jump in and let's have a discussion. So what is a short circuit? A short circuit is an electrical circuit that allows a current to travel along an unintended path with no or very low electrical impedance. This results in an excessive current flowing through the circuit. OK, that's that makes sense. And. Fuse another also, side. Of, yes. So another side effect of the of uh, or another property of a short circuit that it, it's very easy to detect. It's very easy to troubleshoot. Sure, you might blow up some wires or something, but if you can reproduce the problem, you can usually find it very quickly and, and fix the problem. Yeah. Uh, on the other hand, loose connections, what happens in a loose connection? Right. So there is uh, typically when you have a, a contact that is loose, you'll have an increase in the contact resistance there. There will be localized sparks, localized heating. But the dangerous thing is that the overall current in the circuit does not increase, right? So you have a fuse, you have a circuit breaker, all those guys say everything is fine, right? But this area gets heated up, heated up, heated up, and suddenly, you know, the temperature goes beyond a point and anything combustible nearby is going to catch fire here. So I, I found this picture, very nice example on the internet. Yeah, you see this, uh, this nut is glowing red hot because of the loose connection, right? So you can imagine the temperature that is at. So of course this goes on until something gives, right? And you have disaster. Uh, and 
there are there are so many examples and this has even happened in in my home actually uh, many years back when i had a loose connection in my motor wiring and there was a fire in my garage thankfully it was detected and and fixed pretty quickly so how do you prevent loose connections high quality components high quality work make sure connections are made well tight and continuous monitoring because things go bad you have to replace it but even then mistakes can still be made right even the most experienced person can make a mistake and this could lead to disaster so my argument is and i believe that a loose connection is far more dangerous than a short circuit why am i talking about this because we can use an analogy to electrical failures to also talk about software failures one type of error is your logic error you can have uh, you know uh, you can increase your test cases test coverage and you can persuade these errors to occur you have good test harnesses that check all the boundary conditions inject the boundary values and cross the boundaries exercise all the code parts and you can detect those errors with tests you can do static code analysis uh, if you have a good compiler with good warning messages you can get that so these sort of errors behave like like a short circuit right you if you you it first of all you can you can uh, persuade it to happen by having good test cases right uh, and then once you find it you can solve it very quickly the other types of issues let's talk about memory corruption all right so here is a, an example in c and i am assuming all of us uh, have uh, you know have worked in c so this is a simple code we can understand it so let's go through the code we have the main function here and i'm allocating uh, 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 an integer on the heap uh, with a value of 5 and i'm passing the pointer into the function called fn let's jump to the function fn uh, print the value and this fn deletes the value so we gave the pointer to fn fn took the pointer deleted it now we continue back in main and then we assign a value into a 10 if you compile it using gcc all warnings enabled nothing is going to no errors it's going to compile perfectly fine this is valid c okay surprisingly it runs without any error on my machine as well but this is an undefined behavior as per the c specs this, you should not do this what happens is undefined right it may blow up your computer and you know we don't know <laughs> but the the point is this is this is a memory corruption right so if you want to you can you can dig deeper and uh, you can oops sorry wrong direction yeah so i ran val grind and this and you can catch it that there is an invalid write of size 4 at a certain address so there is a problem right but the problem is not caught at run time so this is a loose connection this is a problem waiting to happen it's not a, it's not going to cause any trouble now but 2 hours later when you know some memory which uh, this got allocated uh, this area got allocated to some other program uh, some other thread or some other region of code wants to use it and instead of expecting a character there it's going to see a value of 10 and that's the beginning of your fire right and these are incredibly hard to find uh, and fix later on let's talk about a different type of error data races and for this i take an example from go language and uh, if you follow this link you will see the uh, uh, so google talks about data races and they have a they have a runtime or a compile option called race detection which helps you detect this uh, during runtime of course it adds overhead into the language when you do this test so you only uh, enable this race detector when you think you have an issue but let's jump in yeah so you have a main function and here this go function here is is like a is a separate thread so this this curly brace this block is a separate thread and uh, 
what are we passing into the thread? We are using in the thread a, a hash map, a, ma a hash of a string and a string. Okay. And so we are accessing that hash map inside this thread. Also, we are accessing the same hash map outside the thread. So what's going to happen is either this one runs first or this one runs first or both runs together. We don't know what's going to happen. That's unpredictable. But the point is that if this happens, this hash map can get corrupted because the hash map itself is not thread safe. It does not have locks inside to protect from multiple threads from accessing, especially during a write. So this will cause again memory corruptions, which may or may not be, which may or may not cause a crash right now, but will certainly cause a problem sometime in the future. The principle here is that concurrent access to a memory location when at least one of them is a write can lead to crashes and memory corruption. This is a loose connection waiting for the fire to happen. Another interesting problem, integer overflow. Uh, this piece of code is from the Linux kernel. Uh, you can find the link here. And this bug was found in January just last month. With this bug, uh, an attacker can inject uh, code into the kernel and uh, inject code and get it executed without the necessary privileges. How does it happen? The problem here is that the size variable is defined as an unsigned. And here is a check. So this check is doing a mix of unsigned and signed. And at the end of, because of this wraparound, uh, this negative number, uh, when it does a length check, the negative number becomes a positive number. And this check will just pass through without detecting an error. And then it'll, it, instead of returning, it'll continue the execution and it'll copy and allocate, uh, copy data into, uh, into the, data structure which is not allowed to in the first place so an attacker can have a, a payload in that data and force the kernel to execute something which is not supposed to be executed so this is the real bug which is found last month in the linux kernel and the security researchers are uh, a lot of the work that the security researchers are doing are they're looking for code like this there's so much of open source code they're 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 pouring through the source code and looking for these issues, right? They're all very simple mistakes to make, but they have very, you know, uh, serious uh, uh, effects, right? Using this, these are the things that company like NSO or, or uh, programs like Pegasus, right? Uh, exploit to attack systems, simple mistakes like this. So what is the solution uh, to these kind of problems? Static code analysis definitely helps. It's uh, it's a big overhead. You you develop your code, you uh, you test it, and then you run this analysis tool, which is usually out of band. I mean, you have a separate tool to do this, and you look at the results from it, and then you integrate it back. So, it's it works uh, to a large extent, but it there's no guarantee that it's going to catch all the errors. You can do checks at runtime, like Valgrind. Uh, like I showed you before, Valgrind detected the first problem with the, with the invalid memory, right? This helps only during development, right? You can't you can't do these tests at, at runtime because Valgrind is an emulator which, which really slows down your program. Obviously, maximizing test coverage helps, but maximizing, right? You, you cannot have 100% or it's very, very difficult to have 100% test coverage. Of course, you need to have highly skilled developers. As you see, these mistakes are incredibly easy to make, right? Even, even experienced and skilled developers can make these mistakes. Like as you, the example in the Linux kernel, right? It, not everyone uh, has uh, uh, permissions to write code in the Linux kernel, right? So obviously somebody who put that code in is an experienced person, but mistakes are made. Formal verification uh, is very powerful. Uh, this is using uh, more mathematical uh, proofs to prove that your code is working. This is pretty good, actually. If you're able to write code in such a way that can be formally verified, tools are specialized, people who know how to do this are very specialized. It's great, but 
uh, it's it's very difficult. Formal verification introduces some constraints in how you can write your code, especially when it comes to systems programming. When you're when you're doing some uh, crazy stuff with your registers, with your hardware, it's it's hard to formally verify such pieces of code. But still, all all problems may not be found. Uh, again, formal verification may find these if you're able to formally verify all your code. But formally verifying all your code is not so easy. Now, let's look at some of the CVE statistics. So CVEs are the uh, vulnerabilities which have been found. Uh, there's a database maintained by the NIST. And here, 35% of the reported vulnerabilities last year, and this is 35% of the top 25, right? Uh, in 2021, belonged to these just four categories we discussed, right? And uh, you can follow this link here, and in this link you will see the top 25, and then you can go further in, and in the top 25 you can get the counts, and you do the simple math, and this is the number you come to. 35% of the bugs reported are due to these four issues, four categories of issues, or th these three categories of issues. 35% uh, depending on who you talk to it may may be big or it may not be may not be big but remember these are the type of issues that are very hard to debug right it's once you have a complex system and you have this issue it is really really hard because it's a, it's a loose connection and you don't know where this where the mistake is uh, the mistake may be in one file in one region but the but the the side effect is happening somewhere else and you're going and you add debugs the problem stops happening. It, it, it's very, very hard uh, to debug. And my experience has been like these these takes hours and hours, sometimes even weeks to find the root cause and fix. Right. So this is a huge time sink. And again, 35% may not be big, but remember, these are the issues that are reported. I believe uh, uh, Pegasus, for example, if, if they have found an issue like this, uh, why would they report it? They will keep it. As a secret, and they will use it to attack to attack uh, systems. So, 35%. I'm sure it's more than that. Attempting to address this at source when writing the code will take an immense amount of effort from the people developing software, uh, because C, C++, Go, they're all you know the language is really powerful, but it's very easy to make such mistakes. I'm sharing this picture because we just spoke about statistics. Anybody here does not know the background of this picture? Fantastic. So then I will not talk a lot about this, but basically the thing is we know only the reported issues, right? Uh, we do not know how many issues are out there not reported, kept secret. Right, so we, we can't really make a judgment on, on these numbers. But we know what we know, but we don't know what we don't know. So enter Rust. So Rust is a systems programming language like C and C++. But it is also a general purpose programming language, right? So what that means is, you, you know, it, it's not just for systems programming. People are using it for writing more higher level applications as well. And uh, one unique selling point about Rust is that, you know, it is performant, it is reliable, and it is productive. You can pick all three. You don't have to sacrifice any one of these three uh, when you write your software. So I think it's time to take a small pause. So uh, just to get some interaction, I would like to hear any feedback on the previous part of the presentation. Any questions, comments, counter arguments? Until now. So, uh, Tom, is Go also a system programming or it's an application developer? I mean, how is it designed for? Uh, you're asking about Go? Yeah, right. Uh, Go is also seen as a systems programming language. Uh, however, it is not so low level like C uh, because Go, Go has a runtime. Uh, so, what that means is you, you cannot run Go on a microcontroller, for example, right? Bare metal. It's 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 far more challenging. Go has Go needs a runtime, but it is a systems programming. Like so, for example, you have applications like uh, 
uh, Kubernetes, and these are all written using Go, and these are all system programs. Okay, thank you. Uh, Sojan, I think I didn't know about that uh, aeroplane, whatever you showed about the defects or whatever that uh, thing. If you could explain, I was talking into the mute when you asked if somebody didn't know. Maybe you could, that's interesting also, the previous slide, I guess. Yeah. Okay, so this is a, a story from one of the world wars. I don't remember which, but basically the story is that uh, there were these warplanes which were coming back after battle, right? And uh, uh, they looked at where all the warplanes were hit and the red spots were where the warplanes had uh, had been shot. OK, so the people doing the analysis, they what they did is, OK, it looks like the these are the places where the warplanes are, are, are being hit every time. So let us protect these areas. More, you know, add additional armor and all those things, and they wanted to do that. But then uh, a statistician or mathematician looked at this and said, hey, hang on. Uh, that's not the inference you should make from this. Mm -hmm. You should strengthen the areas where the bullets have not hit. OK, OK. Why is that? Because it means that if a bullet, remember these are planes that came back. The planes that did not come back probably got hit in those areas. So these are the areas actually where it's safe to get hit. So if you want to be strengthening the plane, strengthening, strengthen them in the places where you've not been hit. Okay. Because hitting, getting hit there is probably fatal, and that's why that plane okay. didn't come back. Hmm. Right. Yeah. So being aware of what we don't know is is very important when making decisions. So that that's why I want to put this picture. So 35% of reported bugs are due to this. My argument is it's going to be far more than that. Okay, thank you, Sergeant. Thank you very much for the oh, beautiful okay. explanation. Um, I actually joined in a little late, so is it possible that uh, you can share the list, uh, a link to the slides, so that I can quickly look through all the other uh, vulnerabilities that you talked about? I was there to see the last three only. Uh, sure, the slides will be shared. I'm not sure if this is being recorded. Maybe recording is also available. Oh yeah, recording is also available. Yeah. Yeah, recording will go on our YouTube channel. Uh, also for the organizer, can you enable chat? Because if uh, there's sometimes uh, some questions that maybe uh, someone else in the audience can also answer or, uh, you know, uh, that we can ask without interrupting the flow of the speaker. No, Microsoft Teams doesn't allow chat for external people, for guests. I see. All right. Yeah. Thank you. I mean, at least uh, we have not figured out how to do it. So uh, any, you have to ask your questions through the microphone. All right. OK, that was the interval. Uh, now we get into Rust. So Rust is a systems programming language, but it is also a general purpose programming language, as you see. Mm, and it builds on this principle of ownership and borrowing. Very powerful concepts, very simple concepts, but 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 the 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 stability and the reliability of the language drives from this. Rust guarantees that software developed in Rust is memory safe and free from data races, and it introduces this concept of ownership and borrowing. Uh, I will not go deep into ownership and borrowing because that will take a bit longer. But the key is this: there is always only one owner of a piece of data. And they can only be a single mutable reference to that data. And you cannot force a compiler to do otherwise. So the best way I think to, to demonstrate this is to go back to our problems, the, the, the uh, data race, the memory corruption, and the integer overflow. And let's see how, how these uh, look in Rust. So here is an example of use after free. So you see here, uh, there's function main. Uh, we create uh, a variable on the heap. In Rust, the box new is, is, is the box uh, type is what helps you create memory on the heap. We initialize with five. And we pass that value into a function A. And then we attempt to dereference that A and assign 10 to it. What is happening in the function? The function is taking the A, it's printing it, and I've come into this piece out. Uh, drop A is basically freeing it. But in Rust, the moment a vari variable goes out of scope, it, it gets 
automatically uh, deallocated. So this is not needed. You can have it. But what happened here is that the ownership of A is passed into the function, right? And this is no longer possible, right? So you see here, moved occurred, uh, value is moved. So you cannot use the moved value. Uh, in C++, the move uh, operator or was introduced uh, not so long time back, but this is similar. This is built into the language. You don't need any you know funky constructs to implement the move. The language is by default move. Everything moves around. So this variable a is moved into the function a, and you can no longer access it in the scope of function of the main function. Right. So this is the idea of ownership. Ownership of a is passed into the function. So you cannot do a use after free. In Rust, if to if you try really really hard to do it using unsafe blocks and so on, but uh, and and the beauty is that these are caught at compile time, not runtime, and this is really powerful. Next one, data races. So here, same example implemented in Rust. We create a new hash map. Uh, we just insert I one. Think, uh, so Jim, sorry, there is a question from. He has raised his hand. Have we called? Uh, yes. So uh, in in the previous slide uh, where you move the variable out of uh, the scope of main into the scope of func, uh, mm -hmm. it, like if like if I return from func, will that uh, like move the ownership back to main? Like is there a way to uh, change the value through a uh, through a procedure and then bring it back to the same scope? Uh, yes, so you have to explicitly send it back. So the return value of func, if it is of type A, then you can send back A, send the ownership back to A. But while A is owned by the function, you cannot have anybody outside the function access A, and that is ensured by the language. All right, thank you. So in that way, how does asynchronous uh, task happen? It's all sequential, like. Right? Fantastic question. We'll come to the async in the third example. So here, data races. We uh, we create uh, a hash map. We insert uh, you know key one and value a just just to I don't know just to add it there. But here is we create a new thread, and we try to insert a uh, value two and B into, into the hash map. And outside the thread, we try to insert a value of three and C. In C, this will compile fine. In Go, this will compile fine. But in Rust, this will not compile, right? So you cannot, because the ownership is passed into the thread, right? So you no longer can access M from here, right? So, this this problem is caught at compile time. So of course, uh, as uh, someone just asked, so how how do you handle asynchronous programming? So you do want to send things into another thread and and you know communicate between threads. With this particular concept, it will make it impossible to send data to threads. So now we'll try the attempt two. So for attempt one failed because you cannot compile. Attempt two. Yes, now we can. Uh, what Rust forces us to do is that you have to put that hash map into a into a data structure that has ref counting and thread safety, right? And this this arc gives you reference counting. Mutex gives you thread safety. You put the hash map in there, and now the language will allow you to pass it into the thread, right? So. The language knows about threads. It knows when something is sendable across threads, when something is some something is uh, usable across threads, and at compile time, it will enforce that you follow those rules, right? So when you do this, now you can the code will compile, and no matter how many threads you spawn, this is guaranteed to be safe and behave the way you expect it to. Does it answer the question about uh, async? Yeah, it is still async only, right? Yeah, because unless the thread uh, unwraps it, you know, uh, the one which M lock unwrap three will not get called, right? This will get called, of course. So, so you have now two threads, right? So you have the thread in the main function, and then you have another thread here. 
which is running this. Now, because of lock, so lock is a method of basically the mutex. So you're taking the mutex lock, then unwrap is just uh, looking at the type inside and you want to insert the, these values. Okay, now these will run parallelly, but of course, when you have the mutex, uh, it is going to ensure that only one of these will run at the same time. So the data structure is protected. You will not have memory corruption because now you're forced to use a mutex. Which is the right thing to do, which is the right thing to do. But in other languages, the language will not enforce it, right? So in C, you, C or C++ or Go doesn't force you to do this. It's going to accept the code without it and it's going to compile. It may even run without any problems for now. But later on, when, when you add more code to the code base, then the problems start appearing. But here, in Java, it is in Java also you have that you know object log, of logs to handle threading. Well, so in in, in Java you you um, Java is more of an interpreter. It's not a systems language. Right? This is the the uh, the the USP of Rust. This is a low level systems programming languages, and these these things are used at uh, at a very low level in the system. Okay, fine. So, yeah. So we, we can't really compare Java uh, to Rust because uh, the, 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 the target is a bit different. You're right, Java is not going to crash as well. Yeah, go ahead, Dipiendu. Yeah. Some more questions are pending. Dipiendu, yeah, I just want to add one statement to the previous one. Because comparison with Java, it, it, what it means is in Java, it is possible to write safe code but compiler is not enforcing. In Rust, it is compiler which is enforcing. So that is a big difference. Exactly. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so, then, so I had the same point like what is mentioned currently. So uh, I think in Go also what we can do, uh, uh, I think you, you gave the same example with Go and they are also using the channels. We can uh, I mean, implement the safety, but the point is it is not uh, you know, enforced by the compiler. So that's the that's the addition here. That's what you're mentioning, right? Is that the exactly. correct? Exactly. Yeah. I mean, you can write safe code in any. You can write safe assembly code. No problem. It's just right. uh, uh, not enforced. You can do what you want. Right. And and we have learned it's not easy to write safe code, no matter how how experienced the developer is. The moment you go multi-threaded, it becomes very very complex. Raghunand, your question, please. Uh, hi, Sajan. So uh, I just wanted to go uh, two slides back. Uh, yeah, so here, uh, so this is, it seems like an auto PTR. It's your, okay, you're coming to C++, you're right. So the argument is, yes, we can use, uh, you know, auto PTR or smart pointers to achieve the same thing. You're right. Uh, it's, uh, the point is the compiler doesn't force you to use that. Okay. So uh, right. my question is like, uh, so does it go out of scope here? Or only when we do drop it, it goes out of scope. Uh, you don't have to drop. It will auto drop it. It is going to go out of scope there. The drop is optional. I just show okay. that. Yeah. It goes out of scope, but what happens in main? So main, it still uh, no, is it? It's not. It's there. It's no longer there in the scope of main. You cannot. This is a compiler error. You cannot do this. Oh, okay, okay. So basically, it's like a transfer of ownership. Exactly. You can only oh. have one owner. Yeah. How I to bring it. back the owner, Sojan? Sorry, how to bring back the ownership back? So what is the what is the construct for that in uh, in Rust? So to bring back the ownership to the main. Well, one option is to just return the value from the function. So there's a return okay. operator which I haven't shown here. You can return it return it back to yeah. Main. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So you pass but, it to function, do what you want, and then you return it back to main. Yeah. Okay. Is, is there any other option because? Uh, mostly, uh, okay, uh, I come from a background where I, okay, return values, uh, we have many other, so return values, sometimes for interfaces, we have specific return values, maybe internally inside the code, we can have uh, our own return values, but there are interface functions where we have standard return values and we may want to uh, 
uh, in that case pass by reference in those cases uh, how to return ownership then in that case so you can have you can pass references so uh, from from one function to another but the rule has to be enforced what are those rule you can only you can have multiple read only references not a problem but the moment you take a mutable reference it can be only one and only one right so the moment you take a mute if you take a mutable reference and you need multiple threads then the language forces you to introduce this uh, thread safety and ref counting if you don't I do see. it the language will not allow you to even compile <coughs> okay so in that case in that case so uh, okay but that was not basically okay so so that that i have to introduce there also basically so if i have to change in the main the same um, thread safe uh, the same counting reference counting and also the lock yes to say. yeah if you if you have multiple threads and you want to pass by reference then you are forced to by the language to introduce thread safety it will not nice. compile otherwise yeah that's 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 the powerful part of it right it's all compile time right okay. you c++ doesn't enforce this c doesn't enforce this go doesn't enforce this mm -hmm. okay okay thank you okay quickly uh, deepak <laughs> yeah, so I have one question on uh, if you go back to the slide, right? Uh, the one that we're sharing. So we, yeah, so you use like refm construct here in the thread. Um, mm -hmm. So why can't we use like m here instead of refm? It's like a oh. particular construct for a thread or? Uh, you mean why can't I use m here? Yeah. Okay, if you use m here and you use m here, the code won't compile. Because the code says uh, uh, that's that's the first option I showed you actually, right? So this is the first first attempt. This will mm -hmm. not compile because okay. we passed m into the thread. M is no longer available in the main scope. And if we have like multiple threads, then we need like multiple clones or. Yes. So if you have multiple threads, then you are if you are forced to do this, right? So you are creating an arc new, and this clone, by the way. Uh, you're not cloning the entire data structure. You're only cloning the reference count. Mm -hmm. right? This is your smart pointer. And you're passing the point, the smart pointer into the threads. And that is safe because the smart pointer wraps the data structure inside the reference count and the mutex. So and we there no, yeah, and there's no way you can get at the internal data without locking it and checking the lock is successful. Got it. OK. Again, enforced by the compiler, not convention. Yeah, thank you. Avikal, your question. Yes, so I have a, a very quick one. Uh, so here, uh, it obviously provides mutex as uh, your example has shown. Uh, but does it also like uh, uh, solve for race? For example, if you if, if I'm writing the exact same reference here, you're Inserting uh, B at two and C at three, right? So if mm -hmm. there is B at two and C also at two, does mm -hmm. it also uh, does Rust also have some uh, you know race safety over there? Uh, I didn't get your question. Can you ask again, please? So when two uh, when multiple threads want to write at the same memory location, mm -hmm. so depending on how the scheduling happens between the threads. Mm -hmm. uh, you can get a different value at the end, right? Uh, and that can that is also a, a source of uh, issues in a lot of development work uh, that you have multiple threads, all of them try to write at a at the same point. Uh, for example, uh, look at increments, right? So uh, we have uh, atomic increments in databases because if you uh, you know if, if you just write uh, programmatically, you take the value at plus one to it and try to write it back. And multiple threads are trying to do the same thing. Mm -hmm. uh, even when uh, your program has to run like five times in five different asynchronous threads uh, and should have incre increased by five, it only increases by two or three because uh, multiple threads, uh, you know, read at the same time and wrote the same value at a different time. So those okay. kind of issues uh, basically come in, right? So, so understand. So, so that is really not a, okay. Not a data race that can cause corruption, right? So this. Uh, that that is an issue that is uh, because of the scheduling uh, of the threads. Right. Now, if you if you want to solve that, then you will use uh, atomic. I mean, ARC is an atomic ref count, 
but you can also use atomic in, uh, atomic uh, say uh, uh, integers if you want to sequence something so there are functions like that but that is more of a logic right it is it is control flow it is not about data race or it's not about uh, memory corruption right right so basically rust's uh, safety net is uh, for memory corruption and it's not like a logical uh, flaws are not basically uh, handled yes. in it. Correct. Well, right. I'm not. Uh, there are. I'm not aware of any language that can solve that without you writing that in. So, so sequencing <laughs> and stuff like that. Yeah. I was not aware of the language which could solve even this. So <laughs> I was just like. <laughs> okay. So rest. I am very new to this. Sorry. So last one. Uh, integer overflow. Uh, this is a very hard problem to solve. Uh, but Rust does give give us some help here. So this is the same algorithm or the same calculation which you saw in the Linux kernel code. Uh, there's a unsized page size. There is a unsized variable which of 50,000, which is which we know is going to overflow. And this is the calculation here. If length is greater than page size minus two minus size. So here the size is very large. So this this one becomes a negative number, but because it is unsigned. It becomes a positive number again, so the length check will not found, will not uh, hit, will not work basically. So in debug mode, Rust is fully bounds checked. It checks for uh, overflows of arrays. It checks for even integer overflows. So this will result in a panic at runtime when building in debug mode, which is of course really good, right? So you can catch these errors. But remember, this is. These issues will only happen when you have good test cases, right? So you you can't you can't catch this at compile time, because it's it's unless you know the value of size, you'll not trigger the error. Uh, but you'll have you you will have uh, uh, static code analysis tools which could catch this. But in either case, in either case, the in any case, in debug mode, this will cause an error. So if your test cases are good, uh, you would have caught this, uh, you know, before you, you release it. This is expensive computationally to do this for every uh, calculation. So in release mode, this is disabled. So this will not cause a runtime error in release mode. Uh, but the behavior, the the overflow behavior, is well defined in Rust. So in in C and C plus plus, the overflow overflow behavior is not very well defined. So there's a, there's a different defined way it's going to fail. But in any in any case, if you're writing code like this in Rust, you you are encouraged to use this checked neg uh, additional check opera, uh, uh, functions to integers. Uh, so, for example, in this particular code, I would add a dot check neg unwrap. So this will cause a, a runtime error even in release mode. So rather than do it. Automatically for every calculation, you put it for sensitive calculation where you're doing length check or bounds check of your uh, in sanitizing your input variables. You do this check neg to make sure you're forcing that overflow check. So integer overflows is 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 not caught at compile time usually, uh, but at uh, debug time uh, you can catch it, and at release time you're encouraged to use these additional support. OK, so the, the concept is this. Rust attempts to promote those loose connections to short circuits. Why short circuits are easy to find, easy to debug. You better fail hard when you're developing uh, so that you can fix it right away. Check as much as possible at compile time. If, if your Rust compiler compiles a code, OK, you're pretty sure that uh, this is safe code. It's going to work as written may not work as intended because of logic errors, but it is not going to give you a seg fault. I have worked on Rust for three years. I have not gotten a seg fault in Rust. I've got panics, a lot of them, but no seg faults. And that is, uh, 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 you know, that's a huge thing for me. You have defined behavior at runtime, and you fail with the short circuit. You fail with the panic. and. Uh, with with enough of tests, you uh, your goal is to make sure none of the panics happen, and then you're you have pretty stable release code. I'll pause now for questions. Yeah, earlier yeah, so uh, a couple of you had questions. You can ask them now. Hey, Sujan Adinath here. Hey, Adinath. 
Hi. Um, one question, uh, Sujin, uh, while you were explaining, you said uh, that it will be expensive run time. So uh, when you were explaining that it will have uh, impact of uh, execution time load, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, how much load does it have than the normal C++ code or any other codes? Uh, means in terms of execution time, the trust will increase. Uh, are you talking about in general or are you talking about adding these checks? Um, adding the checks will be only in debug mode, so in release mode it won't be there. But right. overall, in general, how much impact will it have? Uh, not not in terms of adding the checks. Okay, but, so but, understand. So uh, from a, um, let's say from binary point of view, it is similar to C or C++. But of course, it depends on what you're testing and how you're testing, right? So there are there are applications where Rust is far uh, is faster than a C or C plus plus implementation. But there are also you know some tests where C is shown to be faster or C plus plus is shown to be faster. What I can say is it is comparable, right? So uh, comparable to C and C plus plus. Why? Because finally, this is uh, uh, compiling down to binary. There's nothing in between. Right, so and it is using the LLVM tool chain. So if you're developing C++, say using Clang uh, and Rust using, which also uses LLVM under the hood, your end result is more or less the same. Okay, okay. And how how uh, close Rust as a tool uh, will be uh, in near future uh, to comply with uh, functional safety tool qualification? Uh, it is a bit far from there, but there are uh, uh, projects ongoing in the community. In fact, just two days back, there was an announcement by Ferris Systems, and uh, they're working together with the, I think, the Ada Group to to build a, a safe, uh, a certified tool chain for Rust. Ah, okay. okay. Right, so the, the, uh, people are aware of this uh, because uh, when it comes to certification, it is about really more about documentation and uh, proving stuff right so this is a lot of work uh, which has to be taken over by someone so as of today there is no certified implementation of a compiler mm -hmm. but, and, and this is not tied to any specific uh, uh, type of processors right like it is not just targeted towards arm um, it is in general being targeted for right yeah I, i'll i'll cover that in the next uh, couple of slides understood thank you so when you say a certified compiler, I am thinking about C++, the history of C++. So before C++ was standardized, a uh, lot of different types of compilers uh, came about. Many of them mm -hmm. incompatible mm -hmm. uh, with how they, you know, look at a source code. So that's why the standardization body came along, and then the ISO standardized C++. Any such effort is going on in uh, Rust? Or is it all completely driven by the community? So that is, uh, I think I would say it's ongoing. So there is no written standard for Rust. The the code is the standard, but I I am aware of uh, you know discussions that this needs to be written down. Like you say, there, there's there's going to be a point where it has to be written down after a certain evolution, and then it will be written down. Uh, but certification is a bit more than the, the the specification. What you're talking about is specification. So certification is in, in industries like automotive or industries like aeronautical, every tool you use must be certified. Even if you're using Excel for doing something, that has to be certified. It's called tool certification, right? And it is it is basically proving to yourself and others that this tool you have selected is, is not going to misbehave. If it misbehaves, we know how it misbehaves, so we will not make it misbehave. More or less, you know, that sort of certification. All right, moving on. So, uh, one, one question, Purush here. Hey, Purush. Hey, uh, Sojan, um, how much of the low level infrastructure is available? Uh, suppose, I mean, if I want to write my sensor driver, or camera driver, right, uh, mm -hmm. to be a Rust uh, compliant driver, I want to link with the existing kernel, right? The general Linux uh, mainline kernel. I is that possible? I don't know if you heard, but Rust is already part of the Linux kernel now. You can write kernel modules in Rust. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Yeah. Thanks. Sorry. Of course, it has to be one of the later versions. It's in the mainline. Uh, it's still experimental, but 
this is going to move quite fast because the kernel is a perfect place to write Rust because it is close to hardware and you have guaranteed safe programs, right? It's fantastic. You have worked in the kernel for a while. You you must be familiar with how many times you get a panic or oops because of memory issues. Imagine exactly. all those go away at compile time. Okay, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. So other nice uh, stuff. So just, uh, maybe one, one yeah, more question. Uh, Rohit here. Uh, so uh, since now there is a popularity with Rust, uh, so we have seen in the past like how the C++ compilers are evolving. Uh, you know, what if tomorrow, uh, you know, C++ compiler also comes up with this check? Uh, so how do you see from that perspective? I'm not sure if there is already work going on to address this issue. But in one side, uh, you know, C C plus plus we have already, uh, you know, uh, standardized and certified compilers. Mm -hmm. uh, and in uh, there, if we get this kind of checks, what Rust is providing. Uh, so don't you think like if then the Rust will be taken aback if these features, which is very evident, are useful? If it comes, uh, you know, as a part of uh, the, uh, the existing uh, languages and the compilers. Mm -hmm. Good point, right? So, so in, interestingly, Rust has inspired other languages to improve as well, and that is a great thing for us. Uh, but your question about C++, right? So, there's a lot of baggage in C++, right? And 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 these ideas to bring it into C++, you you can't change the syntax of the language. That's a constraint you have, right? And then you have yeah. you need to come up with very complex uh, constructs using I don't know uh, templates and what. To, to do the same things, right? You can't you can't redefine the C++ uh, core, right? Those rules will not change. So whatever comes in, great, but it's not going to be as fluent as as how it is developed in Rust because the language itself is developed with these in mind. It's part of the language. Whereas in C or C++, you have to bolt it on, and it's not so convenient to use. It becomes very complex. So so that's that's what I was talking about here. The, the Rust uses a lot of modern language concepts, right? Somebody working with uh, in JavaScript will actually feel at home working on Rust, you know, with with the concepts of of lambdas and iterators. All these things work beautifully in Rust. And your systems program almost, you know, if you squint hard, it kind of looks like JavaScript, which is a strange thing to say. Uh, oh, yeah. Right, and uh, it's a modern language. Uh, very uh, uses ideas from functional languages, great documentation and great community, right? And my favorite part of the language is the enumerations or algebraic data types and the pattern matching. Once you start using it, you will hate writing C and C++ code, right? It is such a fantastic concept and it, it, it makes your coding so much more uh, uh, easier. Enumeration, and these are not your uh, vanilla enumerations as supported by in C and C++. These are very powerful. Uh, concepts taken from more functional programming languages. Of course, it has templates. Uh, it's got uh, type traits, which is these are so, sort of interfaces on types. Uh, const generics, uh, it's continuously evolving, uh, but it's also there. Const generics are basically compile time computations you can do in uh, in the language so that uh, you know it's generic, but it is. It is all uh, executed at compile time, so so your runtime impact is zero. Async await is uh, if if you're working on C++, you may be familiar with the C++ boost ASIO library, uh, and you know ideas like that. So async await is the keywords are part of the language itself, and there are very powerful libraries built to take advantage of this to write asynchronous code. Uh, very good for network. Uh, networking for IO and so on. There's a powerful macro language built in. So you can uh, do some fantastic stuff with this macro language. So deserialization, serialization, uh, code generation, all these things can be built into the language or built into the code without using external tools. You have seamless integration with C. Uh, so for an, as an example, I'm developing a product which is running on the STM32 microcontroller which uses free RTOS implemented in C and the applications written in Rust, right? So remember there's a microcontroller class of product with uh, 20 kilobyte of RAM and uh, what, 64 kilobytes of flash. I have Rust integrating with C. So 
it is a seamless integration with C. You can do this uh, on your Linux machine as well. There are a lot of powerful tools to uh, create. You know, from Rust, you can create a C, uh, C API, which can be used by other languages. Or from uh, you know from Rust, you can call into C API provided by some other language. Uh, last but not the least, uh, you know, uh, well not last but definitely not the least, this is Cargo Package Manager and Build Infrastructure. So, if you really want to avoid using it, you can. But I, I'm not aware of anybody who's not using Cargo. It is it is it Cargo is a package manager plus the build system all built into one. Uh, there is the crates.io is where the ecosystem is built up, where all the packages reside. And it's it's very convenient to quickly build up an application, add libraries, and build it all in, in one tool. Right. So that that is actually, I believe, one of the reasons Rust has picked up so well is that because of the package management built into the system. Uh, this is really powerful. Uh, I didn't mention this when talking about the language, but sometimes you do need to do bad stuff in the code, right? So you 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 do need to uh, dereference de a memory uh, which is coming from somewhere else, or you need to do something that you know is unsafe, but uh, well, you know is safe, but the language thinks is unsafe. So here you can create small blocks in your code, saying, "Yo, I know this is unsafe, but please allow it. Uh, I know what I'm doing." So this is very commonly used in uh, when you're when you're doing embedded programming or when you're doing systems programming when you want to reach out to the os os system calls you will use these unsafe blocks so you have those escape hatches which you can use sensibly to uh, access other functionality no inheritance i put it as nice other nice stuff because uh, i think inheritance uh, is being overused uh, and you know Coming from a software, uh, you know, if, when we study in, in engineering colleges, you know, OOP is the greatest thing ever. And we spend so much time on inheritance, creating hierarchies of animals and, and uh, you know, uh, birds and stuff like that. But in the real world, having complex inheritance hierarchies are, are, are uh, it's challenging. It makes code very unmaintainable. So there is no inheritance in Rust. You basically use uh, type traits. You have interfaces and you have... Uh, you put these types together, and Rust code is very uh, easy to change. So you use the type system, you use the compiler, uh, you change something, you just fix all the compile issues, and the code is going to work. I think that is the last nice thing. Yeah, of course, this is just a lot of other nice things. Uh, these are some of the key points I could think of right now. Where can you use Rust? Uh, you can use class, uh, Rust on your PC, uh, Windows PC, Linux PC, or Mac PC mm, on the cloud or Edge, right? So all the cloud providers provide Rust these days. In fact, all the cloud, all the big uh, companies are already using Rust for some of their uh, important applications. You can even use Rust in the browser. So you can compile to the WebAssembly target and you can run it on the browser or inside Node.js. That's pretty cool. You can run it on embedded systems. So like I mentioned earlier, I, I am using Rust on SCM32 for a product. Uh, you can run it on Raspberry Pi Pico. That is the new board which has come out, our Pi 2040. It's really cheap. You know, Just buy, buy a few of them uh, before they go out of stock, like 300 rupees or something. Uh, at SAM, and there's a whole bunch of other supported boards. So you can follow this link here, and you will see the supported boards where you can write Rust on embedded systems. Uh, you can target Rust in the eBPF virtual machine. Uh, so if you want to write applications that are monitoring security performance on Linux, uh, you can do that with Rust. Solana blockchain, for example, uses eBPF, and you write the contracts using Rust. This is just a small list, uh, which you know some of the highlights. There are much more places where you can run, run Rust. In fact, any target that is supported by the LLVM tool chain uh, can, you know, you can enable Rust on that. All right, so now we'll come to the, we'll ramp down the presentation, just a few more slides. Why you should learn Rust? Uh, first of all, many performance and security critical software is definitely being written in Rust. Some are public, some are not so public, but people have realized, uh, you know, that yes, this is this is something novel, uh, powerful, 
feature of the language that if you want to build something secure, this is the language to do it. Uh, this is my personal experience that learning Rust will improve your C and C++, right? We all love program in multiple languages, but knowing this language, you just avoid things which Rust will not allow. Automatically, your C and C++ coding will improve. Uh, the crates ecosystem is growing really nicely. There are a lot of smart people putting a lot of crates there. Very powerful libraries are available in the crates ecosystem. That's the crates.io URL. Rust on embedded systems, this is, is really fantastic, right? So you focus on the problem at hand, really high level programming language running on bare metal is really liberating. So it is a language that delivers on its promises. Uh, it's not a hype. And you know, one of the, uh, the problems is that the developers who learned Rust, uh, you know, me, for example, you know, once once I got it, suddenly I'm trying to evangelize people. And that's that sounds, I mean, other people may not like, like, why is this guy trying to push the language so much? So I'm not going to try and push it very hard, but my, my feedback is, okay, just give it a shot. Try to understand the concepts. And, uh, you know, once you understand the principles of it, it's, I'm sure, uh, uh, you know, you you would you would try to use it in some place or the other. Rust has also recently yes. got the attention of uh, CXO level people, right? Uh, this this creates some buzz in the Rust community, uh, but the community is very nice, and uh, you know, some of the people in the community were not very happy about this tweet because it's a Rust is continuously evolving. It is not perfect yet. Uh, it aims to be perfect. Any questions? I saw there's one question. Uh, let's uh, think of here. Uh, basically, you know, while a lot of good things, what are the what are the things which you felt, uh, you know, the disadvantages or something which is a pain in using Rust? Uh, definitely, learning it is uh, uh, when it comes to complicated stuff. Uh, you know, you will hit some uh, challenges in learning. You just have to go through it. Uh, I think that's it. But I believe it is it is it is not as hard as modern C plus plus, right? If if anybody can learn modern C plus plus, anybody can learn Rust. And in fact, I believe for somebody new to programming, somebody new to systems programming, let's say if you're a company uh, who want to train some freshers in systems programming, this is a great language to put them on because you know that uh, you know. You can't cause these issues that are hard to debug later on. You can't cause data races. Just focus on the problem at hand. So I think this is a great first language to learn. Um, so other than that, the challenges are, yeah, OK, so there, there are some targets where this is Rust is not available, right? So some, you know, for example, there may be some CPUs where this you just cannot program Rust in. like. ARM is supported, MIPS is supported, RISC is supported, but there are some esoteric CPUs used by the automotive industry where you cannot use Rust. Hope I answered your question, Tinko. How is Rust written? Yes, yes, sorry. sorry, there was another question. Raja, uh, how is it? Rust written? In which language it is written? Uh, Rust is written in Rust. So it was bootstrapped very early on. Uh, I think originally it was C++, but then very early on they switched to Rust. So it is a bootstrap uh, language. Rust compiler is in Rust. OK, who, who, this, uh, who created Rust? This was developed by Mozilla Foundation originally. I think what uh, around the same time, maybe slight, it started slightly before Go. Uh, the reason why they developed this language is, is, is to improve the Firefox browser. Right, but then this this took a life of its, of its own. In fact, a lot of components in the Firefox browser are written in Rust. Newer components are slowly being replaced in Rust, and you can read up on how using this improved their security and performance. And then, uh, in fact, some people say, you know, the most important product out of Mozilla is not Firefox; it's actually Rust. But now it is uh, run by the Rust Foundation. It's not uh, controlled by Mozilla. 
So it's more of a larger community now. A lot of big companies are on this uh, community. Sure, thank you. So this is Arvind. I have a question. You said it's not there is no inheritance. Mm -hmm. So obviously it's not an object-oriented programming language, I would think. So uh, what do you call? How would you classify it? Is it like a functional pro closer to functional programming or something else? So actually, inheritance is not really an attribute of an object-oriented programming language, right? You don't need inheritance for object-oriented programming language, right? In fact, uh, if you if you look at the C++ world, people more and more say. I mean, there's written down, right? Use uh, uh, use composition instead of uh, inheritance. So inheritance is, you know, using inheritance in in a very simple way is is good to have. But when when you start having complex inheritance hierarchies, it results in code that is too brittle and hard to maintain and hard to debug. So even in the C++ community, inheritance is used very limited now. So Rust is an object-oriented programming language. You have this idea of objects. You have objects uh, with, with, which support interfaces or traits, uh, as it's called in Rust. It also has the ideas from functional programming languages. So it, it is it is it takes ideas from both. Thank you. Uh, any other questions from others? I think even Go yeah, does not uh, have inheritance, yes. right? So this is the last uh, last slide, I think. So first of all, the documentation. The first link is the book. It's called the book. Uh, you typically that's your entry point into the language. You don't really need to buy any you know any other book. There is uh, this book is really nice for an introduction. A whole bunch of YouTube videos if you want to get into nitty gritties. Uh, it's a language that's very easy to get started on. And then there's a bunch of sites here which I use just to see, you know, the status. So, for example, are we web yet? And this is exactly uh, uh, output from there. So, for web programming, when I say web programming, I'm talking about writing web servers, writing web APIs. Yes, so a lot of libraries available, very fast uh, performance libraries, which is used in the real world today by many of the big, uh, let's say, uh, companies uh, writing their, implementing their components using Rust. Uh, so this is an interesting read, and if you keep following it, you'll find out. Okay, for gaming, for uh, uh, machine learning, and so you'll find other domains. So depending on your domain, you can go and check uh, what the status is, what are the libraries available, how you get started on. So if you're new to Rust, start with the book uh, on your favorite programming environment. You know, Windows is fine, Linux is fine. Uh, VS Code IDE has uh, good plugins for Rust. There's a Rust Analyzer plugin. Uh, works great. That's it. So hopefully, you know, uh, this picks your interest in Rust. You, you you learn learn it a bit more, try it out. And my personal opinion is that uh, this is just a start for Rust. Uh, people have have started to notice that yeah, this is this is something different and powerful. And I think we're going to hear much more uh, about Rust in in this, in this year. That's it. Questions? Uh, Rohit here again. Uh, sorry. So uh, from automotive perspective, uh, like how is it gaining the popularity or OEMs or uh, the tier ones are looking uh, for using Rust or still they are uh, right now, you know, waiting, see how things progress and then very fast. Uh, I don't. I'm not aware of any tier ones actively using Rust, but uh, that is when I say, you know, on the target, right? So if you're using yeah. cloud services and all that, obviously you're using Rust already. You may not know it, but on the target, yeah, I yeah. think I think it's going to be a bit slow. Maybe like if I if I'm given a choice, I might write a you know a security component using Rust, which is running on the target. Right. So if, for example, if there's some intrusion detection software. I would use it. I would try it up in Rust. So I would start small and then see how it goes. Okay. At least in the cloud world, I have seen good traction. But on automotive uh, side, I have not, you know, seen many discussions. Uh, right. 
I think I think it'll come uh, this year uh, in in the autonomous world. Uh, you know, Rust is being used in the drone domain. Uh, uh, you know, the what do you say? Uh, autonomous drones. They are using Rust. Uh, and because there are new domains, so they jumped into Rust. Automotive has again a lot of baggage, so it's going to take a bit more time to uh, to move move or change or even start using Rust.